Good morning and welcome to worship. Today is another day, another gift from God to rejoice in him and realize the gift of being alive. God is faithful and sustains his creation and that's you and me and our ability to make a living and live in general. God is faithful, we are not. Realizing that, we start our service off confessing our need for his goodness, confessing our need for Jesus. Dear Jesus, you made me to be free and to freely serve you and my neighbor in love. I confess to you today that I have not lived a free life. I was born predisposed to sin. I have continued to let myself be drawn to sin. I have ignored your call to love and have indulged my own sinfulness, anger, bitterness, and lust. I live like a prisoner to sin. I see this. I am grieved over it and acknowledge it without excuse. Turning to you, I ask, please forgive me. Because of your cross, take away my guilt and give me a new spirit to serve you and to live free from sin, free to be yours as you made me to be. In your name, amen. The bad news, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that's you, me, and everyone. The good news is, even though we have sinned and earned death and hell, God became a human being, born under the law, born to deliver from the curse of the law and all of the bad things we've done in breaking God's law, born to deliver us from all of that and to give us peace with God now and hope beyond this life. This is what Jesus came to do. This is God's will for you in Christ. Live forgiven. If you have turned to him, your sins are gone. Be free, be clean, and begin again. Amen and amen. We continue praising God this morning with songs. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Storms 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, where he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, Grace, receive, grace, grace. 
from Galatians chapter 5. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. For each one should carry his own load. Anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for these words as well, words that stand in contrast and words that guide us as we are together and as we are in individual times with you. Help us to live these properly and with a good balance and help us to continue to learn, live, and grow and be light and salt to a world that needs it from you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, this is our last Sunday looking at the book of Galatians, that significant book that defended the gospel, that is to say the doctrine and the reality that we are saved by grace alone through faith in Jesus. And the good news of Jesus is that justification by faith in him is the only way to have your sins forgiven. That's it. There's no other way for this to happen. And yet, this is something that is freely offered. God has sent out people asking people to receive this from him. Continually, as we look at this book, we're now left with the question, the question that the Galatian churches had to deal with, which was, okay, now that you're forgiven, what next? What do you have to do to stay forgiven? And this is in context with the Jerusalem Council, which raised the question, how Jewish do you have to be and to live in order to be a Christian? And the prominent question that shows up off and on through the book, and the prominent question at that point was circumcision. Do Gentile converts to Christianity, that is to say Gentile converts now believing in the Jewish Messiah, do they have to become circumcised, which was the mark of being part of the people of God, the Jewish uh, Old Testament people of God? And Paul points out, salvation is a free gift from God by faith. You do not need to do something in order to somehow make yourself um, right with God and make yourself belong to him. The legalists seem to have been saying that Paul was offering a weak and watered-down version of the faith, and they seem to have been calling people to be strong and to do your part and not give up on doing what God has commanded. Um, and regarding Paul, they seem to say that he just seems to be a man telling you to leave the commandments of God, don't listen to him. And so Paul came in swinging, pointing out that no, he was an apostle called by God to serve. And we've asked the question, what threatens your identity in Christ? And there are things that all of us think about and we consider that person can't possibly be a Christian because they do this or they don't do that. And we might even think about ourselves. If I stop doing this, I'm not a Christian. I must not be a Christian. Or um, if, if, if I don't do this, I, I must not really be a Christian. We, we define our identity in how we belong to Jesus based on actions quite often, or at least based in percentage on actions. And again, as we've said, 
There's all sorts of stuff that if you do it or if you don't do it, you know, if Jesus has told you to do it or he's told you not to do it, if you're not following his directions, you're a pretty bad disciple of Jesus, but you're still one of his because you came one of his by faith and you're going to stay one of his by faith. Jesus gave himself to rescue us from this present evil age and you're his because he promised to save you by grace through faith. And that's it. Last week, we talked about how you are called to be free and we looked at the fact that Paul ends up giving guidance as to what it means to live free and not go back under the law, not go back also into sin. And he more or less spells out the idea that you are utterly free from trying to be right with God based on what you do. That's true. And you are freely told that you are a child of God by promise. But you've still got the sin problem. And you became enslaved to sin by following sin. Don't go back there. And beyond that, there is now the need to love one another. Because since you've got the sin problem, if we don't tell you, by the way, you're supposed to lovingly serve one another, what do you think people with a sin problem are going to do with their time? Probably not constructive stuff. So... There has to be stuff that people are now told, this is the way we live as the people of God. And we also talked about how there are obvious bad things that the fleshly nature just naturally does. And we see this running rampant in our world today. And Paul just gives a representative list. It's not an exhaustive list, but sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, wild partying, orgies effectively, and the like. Um, you, you're not supposed to go there. And in contrast to this, the Spirit brings about something totally different. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. And in fact, the Spirit is making these things come about if you will keep in step with the Spirit instead of following your flesh. And so we ended with the note and the picture uh, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And it's a cute picture, but the image there is an orderly procession after a leader. And so in many senses, this fits rather well. Our leader is the Spirit. Let's keep in step with our leader. And now we move into our last look at our last section of the book, which is in many senses all together and yet not, which is a little strange. But this is very, very much what Paul goes with and, and how, how he seems to talk as we move into chapter 6. We look at this, and it seems to be a very, very abrupt change in direction. He says, since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. Let's not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. And then if someone's caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. That seems to be really really kind of an odd way of continuing on. It, it, it really seems like he should have just ended it with, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Why do we now go back to, by the way, keep in step with the Spirit as opposed to tearing at each other and doing bad things to each other, uh, provoking one another, becoming conceited? Why do you do that, Paul? Why do, you, why do you do this change in direction so much? And the answer to this is, Paul was not writing to purely inspire positive, cute spirituality. Now we're following and following greeting card imagery in, in the book. No, these were people that were in the midst of quarrels and crisis and contention. They were arguing with one another over, among other things, um, the question of circumcision and do we need to make one another be circumcised? And it's not even a question of do I need to be circumcised, but it's, do we need to make them be circumcised, which is probably going to be pretty adversarial. And Additionally, we've already read earlier, right after Paul ends up saying, the entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. And so you would figure, okay, well, yeah, they need to love one another. But the next thing Paul ends up saying to this group of people is, if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. And so this is not some church that was just simply needing cute spirituality pointing them to a truth and a great sweet truth, but nothing more. The Galatian churches need to be reminded how they were saved. That's absolutely true. And it's not based on your doing something. But they also need to be reminded to be good and not bad to each other because apparently they were being bad to each other. And so Paul effectively gets into a mode of saying, hey, live spiritually, keep in step with the Spirit, don't be proud and mean. And then he goes on to talk about if someone is 
caught in a sin. And he says, you who are spiritual, if someone's caught in a sin, you should restore him gently. And this is an interesting sort of a thing that leads to the next question, which is, what do we most owe each other as fellow Christians? I'm not talking about people who are heathen that you know. I'm talking about fellow believers in Jesus Christ. Uh, we, we need to love each other. We need to support each other. We need to give each other some grace and some room because we all have this ongoing sin problem. That's very, very true. And so we need to give each other some grace and some encouragement in that. Uh, and we need to not try and figure that any one of us is going to end up being perfect. All of that is true. But we owe each other something more than just that. And if we're not careful, if all we do is give each other grace and never point out, hey, that's a problem, we will, by our silence, allow one another to sink and to stunt our spiritual growth and possibly even to walk away from the faith entirely. And it's not that you can lose your relationship with God by anything that you've done, but you can starve your faith out and renounce it and walk away from it. That's a different problem. We owe each other, Paul says, something different than that. We don't owe each other just our silence. Don't mess with me and I won't mess with you and we'll all just cool off and become lukewarm together. We owe each other a gentle accountability and there needs to be some reasoning in it. You who are spiritual, and that involves people figuring, okay, am I one of the spiritual ones or not? Probably. People probably want to pray with each other and think about who should probably encourage this other person with this problem. You who are spiritual, restore them gently, but watch out or you also may be tempted. And very, very often in contrast to this, we get people who say, I'm going to be the one to go and bring this person to accountability. I'm going to call a, spin, a, a sin a sin. I am going to speak the truth to people no matter what. And we lose the gentleness and we lose the humility. And the call is to restore one another, speak to each other with the truth, which is a strong thing, but to do it with some gentleness and to do it with some humility. Not, I can't believe that you're doing this. None of the rest of us are doing this. No. Far more closely, uh, it's going to be something like, hey, you're stuck in something. We can see that you're stuck in something. You need to come out of that. The rest of us realize it's difficult. We also realize we could be drawn into this sort of a thing. We all need to encourage each other together. And so we are told to live our life of faith in an altogether now kind of way, carrying each other's burdens. And in this way, we fulfill the law, the guidance, the direction, the command of Jesus to love one another. And that's a good thing. So we carry each other's burdens in, in those hard times, especially as people start to get drawn into a sin and run the risk of being stuck in that because sin left unchecked is destructive. It destroys the people around us and unrepentance destroys, it's toxic to our, our relationship with God. So there is that. And in contrast to this, then Paul ends up saying something that can almost seem really contradictory. If anyone thinks he is something when he has nothing, he deceives himself. And each one should test his own actions. And then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. For each one should carry his own load. Wait a minute. What just happened to carry each other's burdens? Uh, how does this work? And what is it that we talk about on the way of taking pride in yourself or what's going on in you? And what on earth does it mean to be thinking you're something when you're nothing? Paul, help us out. Well, take it one piece at a time. First of all, how can you think yourself something when in reality you're nothing? Uh, well, if you take a look at God's ultimate standard for your life, you're not going to do that because once you get a, a sense as to just how pure God is and how holy God is and how much we pathetically just never measure up to that, uh, you're going to realize, no, I'm really not that much to, to boast about. But if I stand next to people, I can compare myself to them and then I can start to think that I really am something. And so we could start to think that we're something when we're nothing if we're starting to compare ourselves to the people around us. And invariably, we prefer to stand where we can be the Great Dane to someone else's chihuahua. We can be the mature one next to someone who's just barely starting out. We can be the disciplined one next to someone who's all over the place, and so on and so forth, because it's more comfortable that way. And then we start to feel 
on the other hand, a little bit nervous when we find ourselves around someone who is the Great Dane to our Chihuahua, and it turns out that they seem to be something and we're really nothing, and we start to beat ourselves down that way. I'm really nothing, I'm pathetic. Well, we all, according to God's holy standards, actually aren't much of anything to boast about. And so God, realizing our tendency to compare ourselves in his wisdom, just takes the comparison business out of the whole equation. The solution to this is don't be comparing yourself to other people, right? Uh, don't lead into things that cause you to tear down other people as you tell some people, I really wish you'd get with it, and the rest of them, you are so great, I am so terrible, and something along those lines. No, we take all the people out of the equation, and we have an honest look at you in light of God's standards between you and God. Are you, in fact, by God's standards between you and God, are you really something? Are you really that much to boast about? And the answer to that is no. Because even if you've managed to discipline your outward life to look really pretty impressive and fool a lot of Christians, the inward heart is drawn to sin, is envious, carries grudges, gets angry at unrighteous things, and on and on and on. Are you something? No, you're really nothing by God's standards. That is inescapable. Now, at the same time, we can carry this too far, and so we can uh, ask, are you something? And the answer to that is no. But along with that, we need to ask the question, are you absolutely nothing? Because some people, again, will take this the other way and will just go to the other extreme. In the ancient world, pride was a virtue, and so people didn't generally go this way unless they'd really had a horrible crash in their life. But for us, the bigger tendency is to continue to think, I'm nothing, I'm rotten, I'm horrible, and well, okay, there's some truth. He's got a point there. In terms of righteousness before a holy God, you're a complete write-off. That's the offense of the cross we already talked about. Uh, people get offended hearing that you have no redeeming qualities that makes you worth saving. That's absolutely true. Uh, sorry if this hurts your self-esteem, but self-esteem really doesn't matter. What matters instead is how God esteems you. Um, and the reality is Jesus had to die in order to save you. That's the only way you could be saved. That is the absolute only way. And so in terms of your own worth based on what you do, or even diagnostically, the ravages of sin in your life, you're a complete write-off. You're a mess. There's just no way around that. That's true. But when we get to the question, are you absolutely nothing? Well, you need to be forgiven. You need to be cleaned up. But you also need to remember that the Son of God was willing to lay down his life for you. Not because of what you have done, not because of your singing voice, not because you're cute, but because God loves you. And we're so hung up on self-esteem, we forget the fact that what matters is not self-esteem. What matters is God's esteem of you and the fact that God loves you. He doesn't want to leave you where you are. He wants to grow you continually. But God loves you. And God loves you enough to die for you. And so you're something in God's eyes because of his love for you. But in terms of how you're doing and how you're walking this Christian life, we never get particularly far compared to where we would need to be. We'll one day see that when we are with God and made right the way we're supposed to be. So questions of whether I'm something, questions of whether I'm nothing, questions of how I'm doing in my relationship with God, these work well. In fact, they only really work well at all if we let them be discovered between us and God alone. And in fact, if we let these be discovered between us and God alone, then we start to develop a good and useful outlook. And we get a different perspective. And we will see some growth, and that's a good thing. We, we need to see that the Spirit's at work, right? We encourage the Spirit, please continue to bring about love and joy and peace in my heart and in my life. And as each of us tests our actions and looks at what's going on in our life, we could take pride in what's going on there. Not bad pride, not ungodly pride, but a sense of satisfaction sort of a thing. Wow, I was all set to do that wrong thing. And thanks be to God, the Spirit of God seems to have pulled me away from that. I was all set to continue my internal rant against that person, and I asked God for help, and he made it stop. And on and on. I was ready to give that stinging, snarky comment, and there was that little nudge 
I'll credit the Spirit of God that said, no, that's going to hurt people. That's not the way to be. And we can boast not in us being particularly good, but we can boast in the fact that God's doing stuff in our lives. Thanks be to God for that. And it still leads to, when it's between us and God, a healthy sense of humility. And this helps us develop the right outlook of humility for when we are back together. And so we get this contrasted idea. We're called to live a life that privately knows and works on our own Christian character, privately, not all together, so that when we are all together, working all together, we can collectively try to help each other in a humble fashion. And so it's not contradictory, it's just sort of two different elements held in tension. Now, the remainder of the book, Paul ends up then talking about, in light of all this, hey, be aware of the fact that God can't be mocked, you're going to reap what you sow. And then he gives kind of an example of that, dealing with foolish boasting, uh, sowing to what? And then he then finishes off pointing to where we actually should boast. So, the next thing, effectively, leading into that is this, this idea of daily sowing. And he starts off, it's kind of harsh language, don't be deceived, God cannot be mocked. Uh, how could God be mocked? Well, people can end up saying, see, where is God? Where is God with his uh, warnings and that sort of thing? I seem to be doing just fine, even with these things going on in my life. Paul warns pretty clearly, you reap what you sow. There will be cause, there will be effect. Especially if you let this grow, right? As a seed, we, we water, uh, we tend, and if something's allowed to persist, it will bear awful, ugly fruit. And Paul already talked about the deeds of the flesh, and they're awful. They are rotten fruits. They poison people. They hurt people. They exploit people. They take from people. And if you sow towards your flesh, you're going to end up with destruction all around you. And the word there can be translated either destruction or corruption. And corruption means rot. Um, and that's either rot in the grave or rot in the heart or both or however you want to look at it. Sowing to the flesh, living in this sinful nature is just going to end up hurting you and hurting other people. You don't want to do that. And if you let these things that you sow grow and develop and bear fruit, it will bear painful fruits. It will bear bitter fruits. You cannot escape this reality. God has said this is what the reality is. In contrast to this, he says, sow towards the Spirit, live towards the Spirit, and you get something that lasts. Well, it says you harvest eternal life. That's true, but wait a minute, I thought I already had eternal life. You do by faith in Jesus, and you get eternal life sorts of stuff. And as we persist in the Spirit, we continue on that trajectory, right? Living to God, living in Christ. If we live in the flesh long enough, that can become toxic to our faith, to our faith just dies. God help us if that's the case, because it's by faith that we're saved, right? God brought that faith about, but that faith can starve out. In contrast to this, sow towards the Spirit, right? Live your life towards the Spirit, praying and spending time in the Word, and tending and asking the Spirit to please grow this love, grow this joy and peace. Living that direction, you get something that lasts into eternity. That's a, that's a hug and a reward at the end of this life. And so we've got this contrasted two different ways that we can live and we can live our lives towards. What are you going to do? You're going to sow towards the flesh and get destruction and corruption. You're going to sow towards the Spirit and get something that lasts. Each day comes with 24 hours of possibilities to be working towards one or to be working towards the other. And it's not just that once you've planted these seeds, that's it. They're just going to grow and you're going to be destroyed. There's room to repent. There's room to pull that stuff out. There's, there's room to pull anger and, and being uh, divisive towards people. There's, there's room to repent of that. And God will pull that out of your, your heart and life. And he can bring you back from that. Um, the question is not just make this decision and then you live with it forever, but rather how are you going to live and in what direction are you going to live? And at the start of each day, we need to be thinking, how am I going to live and what am I going to be sowing towards today? If I sow towards the flesh, I will end up probably stuck and hurting people and in bondage to sin again. 
and needing to turn to God to be released and set free. Can do that, that's not a good place to be. Or I can live towards the Spirit and let the Spirit continue to grow uh, and by His power continue to develop a character that is a little bit more transformed. We will not reach perfection in this life, but this is the way that we live and this is where the life is. And you know, that can be a hard thing to do day in and day out. The the flesh keeps telling us, you're missing the party. I got stuff on my bucket list I want to do. People are having more fun than you. A huge amount of people live their lives afraid of the thought that someone out there is having more fun than you are, that you're missing out. And the world is great at telling you, you're missing out. Uh, You're missing out on pain. You're missing out on misery. You're, You're missing out on sugar rushes that rot you from the inside out. That's what the world keeps telling you you're missing out on. And it can be hard. And God knows it can be hard. This is why we get the encouragement in verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good. And we can get tired of, of, of living this way. Don't become weary in doing good for at the right time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Live this way towards their life. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. All of them. Right? Do not return evil for evil, but return uh, good for evil. Right? To bless when other, others curse. All of these things we've been told we need to be doing in that life of faith, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now, it's interesting that Paul would have to say, especially to those who belong to the family of believers, but remember exactly what sort of church we're talking about. This was a church that was deeply conflicted with each other. And so there is this call, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. And it's a sad situation, but dysfunction can show up and we can find people actually treating strangers better than they can treat um, the members of their own family. Uh, What causes people to do that? Well, as you get close to people, you, you learn where their nerves are and they learn where your nerves are and you get on each other's nerves. And we need to be reminded, hey, we owe loyalty and love and kindness, especially towards our fellow believers. We need to continually find ourselves on our knees. Jesus, forgive me for that. Jesus, help me to see this fellow believer as a member of your body who is part of your church, who I will be spending eternity with, and who you love and have called and have died for. And they're my brother, they're my sister in faith. And so we need to have that outlook. From there, we get an example of where people are boasting foolishly and who they are boasting to foolishly. Uh, That example is, and we're going to avoid uh, verse 11, see what large letters I use as I write to with my own hand. That may have been Paul writing without a secretary, and so the whole thing may have been large, or he may have been writing something as a personal note so that people could recognize his handwriting because there may have been fake letters going out, so this is kind of a way to authenticate it. We don't know. We're just going to step past that because that's not really a a life application thing to be worried about. He says, those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. Um, And remember, the the reason why they're doing this is these are people who are trying to point out, we have not abandoned circumcision. Now, who is it they're going to be most worried about trying to impress with that? Uh, Fellow Christians? Possibly. But it may end up being very much like one of those situations where they have friends who are Jews, they've got other people from a Jewish background that are not necessarily Christians, they've not learned about uh, it all being by grace. And so they're trying to continue to point people to living the ceremonial law. And they're trying to say effectively, or they may be trying to say effectively to the Jews around them, not the Christians, but to the other Jews around them, uh, no, see, we're not really that bad. We haven't walked away from being Jewish. In fact, we're making them uh, become circumcised and live Jewish. Uh, so don't hate us. Don't, don't keep us away from you. Don't think that we're really that bad. And it's one of those weird situations where perhaps you've seen people are trying to apologize to other people who are not within the church to try and impress the people who are not within the church. And by so doing, they're kind of harming or even pushing around the church. And you have to ask the question, what kind of person boasts about stuff that doesn't matter? And circumcision doesn't matter, at least not as far as we understand it in salvation. It matters to Jews because they're deceived. 
What kind of a person boasts about stuff that doesn't matter, pressures believers to do what doesn't matter, to impress people who don't matter so that they don't get picked on? If you're back in Paul's day, well, these were people who were real problems to the church. And we run into people like this today who keep trying to, to cozy up to the world. No, we Christians aren't really that bad. I mean, yeah, we say some stuff is just traditional stuff about morality, but we really aren't really pushing that really hard. And uh, it's not really that big a deal. And you all stop trying to make it such a big deal, right? Because we, we don't want them to think that we're like that. We don't want them to think that we're, we're bad people or anything like that. Hey, you know what? We're not bad people. We are people who've been given the truth of God. And we need to be willing to stand for that truth and point to that truth. And people don't like being thought ill of. I get that. But the answer to that is not to try and impress people who don't matter ultimately. And people who don't belong to God, their opinions, especially their opinions that disagree with the truth of God, those opinions are wrong. And so whether or not they like us, that doesn't hugely matter if they're basing that on the fact that they don't like the good news that we've been given, the word of God that we've been given. So we need to not be trying to, to cozy up to the world. For one thing, the world's going to hate us and not respect us anyway, because the world's going to be hostile to the good news of God. So don't try and impress the world and heaven help us when we have to deal with Christians who seem to try and push us around because they're trying to impress the world. That's not how we're, we're supposed to live. We need to continue to have our focus be on God, not on trying to impress the world. And we should live towards God, not trying to impress people who, in terms of eternity, they, their opinions don't matter. They do matter because God wants to save them, but he wants to bring them to the truth that he's given to us. And so we should glory all together and separately, whether the world's impressed or not, in this, in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he makes a, a description then, through which the world has been crucified to me, through the cross of Jesus, by my belief in Jesus and his dying for me, the world is now dead to me, and I am now dead to the world. And that's a profound picture if you think about it, because what that means is that the world tries to get me to do its thing, and I refuse. It is as if I am dead to it, and... Yes, I understand that my flesh still speaks. That's true because it's still dying and I will have to be putting it to death all the rest of my life. But we do not listen to that which we, have, we put to death and which has been put to death with Christ. We now live by Christ and the life we now live is through Christ. And so we boast in our Lord Jesus Christ. And in light of that, it's all about the cross. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is that new creation that he makes us from the inside out as we live to him. And there were people who were trying to boast and trying to make Christians do other stuff. And they were losing sight of the fact that, no, it's about faith in Jesus first and foremost. And then we live a different life by his spirit. And so Paul then ends up saying, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. What rule? Boasting and glorying in the cross of Jesus Christ and putting our hope and putting our trust in him who makes us a new creation. And in Jesus, you are a new creation. You are called to it. You are kept in it by his promise. And you are empowered to live it by his spirit. So daily, live daily towards the spiritual life and hope he has given that Holy Spirit that he has put in you, that he continues to work in you and with you through spend time in the word spend time in prayer continue to live towards being that new creation and cheer on holy spirit please grow more love in me i need it right grow more peace and patience and self-control so daily to the spiritual life and the hope that he gives these things effectively are at the at the center of this great epistle as we come down to the end of our galatians series boast in each step that he helps you make. That's good to do. Thanks be to God. I did not do what my flesh told me to do. But always, first and foremost, we boast in the cross. Because in the cross, we have the start and the end of our hope of mercy and peace. Live to the Lord Jesus Christ. And may he, in his grace and his love, continue to keep you in that spiritual life. Amen. 
This week, continue to look for a contentious spirit. We are awash with this. We all continue to be needing to be turned to God. God, please help us not to get sucked into being contentious because that is the spirit that we are uh, having to constantly be tempted by. We are constantly having to resist. Think about the gentle humility that we owe each other. Is there a conversation you need to have with someone? A conversation saying, hey, I see this and I think it's destructive. Prayerfully talk with the spiritually mature about that. Don't just impulsively fly off and go do. But if you think that maybe this is something that you are being called to do, find a mature uh, Christian and talk about this with them. Avoid gossip. That's why you're going to a spiritually mature person. But pray about it and prayerfully talk about it. Each day, ask yourself, to what will I sow and to what will I work, the flesh or to the spirit? Pray for the grace and the strength to live to please God and not worry about the world outside. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for this great epistle. Lord, we pray that you would grow us in true faith as we walk with you. Help us to never trust in anything that we have done, but always to trust in what you have done for us in dying for us and forgiving us and calling us your own. Help us now to live as your own in that new identity, rejoicing in the new life that you bring about, but continuing to be founded first, foremost, and always in what you have done for us by your cross. Thank you now, we pray. In God's mercy, like the hardness of Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.